So if your children are suffering from nightmares, the question that you need to ask is, what input have they had to formulate this fear within them? Because it's a fact of life that everything that goes into you forms something within you. My question is this, what's being formed in you? And my big question next is, is Christ being formed in you? If you have your Bibles, I've already opened it up to Galatians uh, chapter 4. I just want to read to you one verse. The title of my message today is this, something is being formed in us. Something is being formed in us. My question is, is the right thing being formed? And so Paul writes to the Galatian church. And incidentally, the Galatian churches, it's plural because Galatia is a region, is modern day Turkey. Matter of fact, uh, where Galatia was back in Paul's days is where Ankara in Turkey is Today, it's in that north central part of Turkey. And, uh, and Paul is writing to these groups of churches in Galatia. And this is what he says to them. He says, my little children for whom I labor in vain, in labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. Today, I want to speak to you about Christ being formed in you. The problem that the Galatian church had was that when Paul was doing his missionary journeys, he actually labored to create this image of Christ within the Christians there. But a group of of, uh, people followed, wherever Paul went, there was this group of people called the Judaizers. And they would literally follow Paul and say to the new Christians, you know what, Paul said is fantastic, but he left a whole bunch of stuff out. And we're here today to tell you what Paul left out. And basically what they did is that they took people back to the Old Testament and tried to make them Jews as well as Christians and tried to get them back to the keeping of the laws and going back to circumcision and going back to, to just uh, the food, the stuff. And, and, um, and when Paul heard about it, he was ropeable. And so he writes this book called the Book of Galatians to basically say, what happened to you? Why did you forsake the simplicity of the gospel and go back to the law? And and what ended up happening was that these Christians then had the formation of the law in them and what Paul had formed in them, the image of Christ, was removed with this new input that they had. Something new was formed in them that was legalistic and not under Christian thinking. And Paul is writing and saying, I need to labor again to reform in you the image of Christ. That's the background. That's the backstory. But every day something is being formed in us. And we need to be aware that whatever comes in is the material that creates formation in us. Don't think for one minute that you can absorb information or you can absorb stuff And it doesn't impact you. It's forming something within you. How many of you got children? Can I just say that we need to be intentional in what is formed in our children? You want to form fear in your children? Expose them to all the fearful stuff that's around. Expose them to the demonic, expose them to witchcraft, expose them to just scary stories. And and as soon as you expose them to anything that's full of fear, you create fear within them. Fear is formed within them. 
So if your children are suffering from nightmares, the question that you need to ask is, what input have they had to formulate this fear within them? Because it's a fact of life that everything that goes into you forms something within you. My question is this, what's being formed in you? And my big question next is, is Christ being formed in you? Because this year, I'm going to work really hard at contributing to forming Christ within you. Why is that? Because as a church, it's our second culture. So as a church, we have three cultures. The first culture is loving God. What's the second culture? Growing spiritually. Growing, and the third culture is obviously helping others. But this growing spiritually is spiritual formation, discipleship, growing spiritually. All these are words to describe this becoming mature Because Christianity is not just about getting a passport to get to heaven and a get out of hell free card. That's not just what Christianity is about. Christianity is about spiritual formation and becoming a man, woman of God who is formed into the image of Christ. It's interesting. You know, I've been reading a lot of stuff on revival. How many of you have been reading stuff on revival? And uh, uh, Helen gave me a book on Azusa Street, the miracles of Azusa Street. And so I've been right into, matter of fact, Helen, show me, show me one of these books that, um, that you've got. It's called, here we go. Sorry for making you get up so fast. Yeah, wow. It's called Great Southland Revival. So... Um, As a church, we want to invest in you by not selling you these books, but actually giving for free. And uh, Helen's got, how many have you got? You got another 70. So if you want to read the history of revival all the way back to the apostles, but specifically the second half of the book is what's happened in Australia and at the Great Southland Revival in Australia. And it's written by a friend of mine called Warwick Marsh, who incidentally is coming to preach at our church on the 7th of May, the Sunday before Mother's Day. Warwick is really excited about coming to preach here on this book on revival in Australia. Are you excited about that? I'm excited about that. He's excited about it as well. And uh, and, uh, the foreword is by another friend of mine, Dr. Stuart Piggin, who was actually on my board when I was president of Alpha Cruces College for 10 years, uh, Dr. Stuart Piggin was on my board, a great man, Anglican, but a great man, very sympathetic to the Pentecostal cause. So you'll enjoy reading. I've enjoyed reading it. I'm still reading it and I'm still reading Azusa Street. So you can have this back. Um, but, But the reason I'm bringing up Azusa Street is because they believed in Azusa Street something called the second and third blessing. So uh, the first blessing is salvation. Then the third blessing is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then they believed in in something called the second blessing. How many of you heard of the second blessing? Some of the old timers, I can see Ralph Esterby's hands going up. My father-in-law's hand is going up. But the second blessing was um, complete sanctification. So there was a whole group of old-time Pentecostals and holiness people that believed that there was an event after salvation called the second blessing where you achieved complete sanctification. And you know what? Now, I I don't believe that. I I believe in, uh, let, let me tell you what I believe in. I believe in something called positional, positional. Everybody say positional positional sanctification. When you are saved, you receive the righteousness of God in Christ. And when God views you, he views you through the lens of Jesus. And positionally, you were justified. You were sanctified as just as if you've never sinned. We call that positional sanctification. But then we also believe in something else called 
progressive sanctification. And progressive sanctification, Paul talks about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. Progressive sanctification is basically what I'm going to be preaching on today. It's having Christ formed in you, where you deal with all the issues of the flesh that you're facing. And, and, uh, and, and, and I think the biggest error that the church is facing today is the error of, well, God forgives everything and you don't have to worry about it. It's the error of we're living under the banner of grace and doesn't matter what you do, God forgives. And it does matter what you do. It, and God does forgive through repentance. But here's the thing. God wants us to mature where we become saints of God and not immature baby Christians that are always losing the plot, always messing up, always allowing the enemy into our lives and sin dominates and rules and reigns in our life rather than the Holy Spirit and the power of God. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. Yeah, if you're going to clap, make it a good one, I say. Yeah, yeah. So let me tell you what spiritual formation looks like. Here it is. Romans 8, 29. Spiritual formation is where we become the image of Christ. Romans 8, 29. I'm Romans chapter 8 is one of my favourite chapters in the Bible. If you are going to read one chapter in the Bible that will set you up, read Romans 8. It is magnificent. And in Romans 8, 29, he says this, For whom God foreknew, he also predestined. In other words, that God actually, in his foreknowledge, saw you getting born again. And... And he saw that, he helped to make it happen. But then this is what it says, but his desire for you, God's dream for you is that you may be conformed to the image of the Son. In other words, God's dream for you is that you might be like Jesus. Everybody put your hand on your heart and say this, God's dream for me is that I may be like Jesus. That's the goal. So we're on this pilgrimage. We're on this journey of maturing. And the ultimate goal is for us to become like Jesus. Now, I, I believe it's when we get to heaven that we'll become like him. But on this journey here, my goal is to be more like Jesus than I was yesterday. I want to be more like Jesus today than I was yesterday. I just think one of the greatest indictments that the world has on the church is how unlike Jesus the church is. And that was Gandhi's biggest complaint. He said, you can, you can read this quote. Gandhi said, your Jesus I like, your Christians I don't like, they are so unlike your Jesus. What an indictment. I, I want to pastor a church where we're Jesus people, where, where people come in and they sense not only the presence of God, but their interaction with the people of the church is a godly interaction, a, a holy interaction, because we've made this desire to be transformed into the image of Christ as, as something that we want. Paul says spiritual formation is when that Christ may live in you, Galatians 2.20. It's no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. This just cannot be a memory verse. This has got to be a passion of our life. It's no longer I that lives. John Giuliano died and now Jesus lives in John. What a wonderful thing it is when Jesus is alive in us. In, uh, uh, in Galatians 1.16, Paul talks about his life, that his passion is that Christ may be revealed through him, that his whole uh, object in life and his whole passion in life is that wherever he went, that Christ may be revealed through him. And then that beautiful 
quote in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.20 where he refers to us as ambassadors of Christ. What a wonderful thing. I, I, I love that quote. I'm an ambassador. I represent the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But you know what? I need to represent him well rather than people saying, what a bad ambassador John Giuliano is. I, my goal in life is for people to say, what a wonderful ambassador of Christ John Giuliano is. Is that your goal? Because if it is, so I, I'm going to tell you this morning what you need to do to create this spiritual formation. But the second thing I'm going to share with you today is what spiritual formation does in your life. Number one, it creates spiritual strength. You go from being weak to being strong. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. What a wonderful thing it is to be a strong Christian rather than a weak Christian. I, spiritual formation creates strength in you. The second thing that it does, it creates maturity in you. And maturity is always seen in your love for God and your love for others. Maturity, immaturity is where your love for yourself supersedes your love for God and love for others. But maturity is seen where it's Jesus first, others second, yourself last. We used to sing that chorus. Anybody used to sing that chorus? Joy, J-O-Y, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. That's spiritual. We used to teach it to little kids in, in children's church. Just this, this maturity is where you place yourself. And if you place yourself first all the time, that's a sign of immaturity. And you see it in your children when it's all about me. No, it's what I want. It's my toys. It's my food. What a joy and a revelation it is for us to be grandparents and have grandchildren in our house. Oh, my goodness. We forgot. But not anymore. We're remembering. And part of our job as parents is to take the selfishness because children are born with selfishness. And part of our job as parents and grandparents is to help them maneuver in life where they become selfless and they're able to share and put others. But what a wonderful thing. And when you see your grandchildren sharing, oh man, you just want to do a happy dance. Huh? You just, it's just beautiful when you see them sharing and it's sharing their food and sharing their toys. And, but, but when it's all about me, 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 you know, it's immaturity. And that's the same with us. Come on. It's a sign of maturity when, uh, when spiritual formation takes in us and then it ushers us into divine activation. And so, again, this year we've called 2023 the year of divine activation. But we can't get activated properly if it's about me. We can only get divinely activated properly when it's, what can I do to serve others? What can I do with helping others? When it's about, everybody look at me, how great I am, how awesome I am. It's like, that's just not the way that it needs to be. The way that it needs to be is, I'm here to serve others. And if I don't get any credit for it, it doesn't matter because it's about God and helping others. That's signs of spiritual maturity. So let me move on into what I really want to say is what we must do to allow spiritual formation. Are you ready for this? What do you got to do to allow spiritual formation? Well, first of all, understand that it's God's will for you, that Christ might be formed in you. Just understand that God wants you to mature, that God wants you to be strong. And not only understand that, but want it. So we get to a place where we got to want this. we got to want to be spiritually mature. we want, we got to want to have spiritual formation within us. We've got to, church, I've just been reading a book by one of my old mentors. So 10 years ago, I had a mentor called Keith Farmer. And Keith is a great guy. And Keith used to come in and, and spend an hour talking with me then an hour talking with Anne, and then he'd bring us together and spend an hour talking to both of us. And it was, it was a really important phase in our lives. And, and Keith, just a really godly man, but he wrote a book just um, that, that I got hold of that, incidentally, if you want to read, it's called Going Deeper to Go Further. And how many of you know Keith Farmer? 
great, great man of God. And uh, in this book, he quotes some research that was done in Australia regarding a thousand people in ministry. And it was done through Macquarie Institute uh, and uh, interviewed a thousand people. And the, the conclusion was this, that those who lasted in ministry were not those who were the most professional or the ones who had the most information, but the ones who allowed the deepest spiritual formation. And he started to see how the lack of spiritual formation actually put cracks in the foundation. It's not that they didn't know a lot, they knew a lot, but it's the foundation wasn't strong enough to hold the pressures of life. And I thought, wow, this is just so important that we give ourselves to spiritual formation. You know, I mean, I've been calling it discipleship for years, but everybody's got their own definition of what discipleship is. And so Keith is talking about this forming a spirituality which is real, forming a spirituality which is deep, forming a spirituality which is consistent, forming a spirituality that's not a show, but is a revelation of who you are as a human being, being formed, having Christ formed in you. So let Christ dwell deeply in you. Revelation, uh, not Revelation, Ephesians 3.17, Paul writes to the Ephesian church and and this is what he says. Let me read it to you. Ephesians 3.17, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. And Paul then just expands this Christ dwelling in you with a root system. And so with root systems, and here I am talking about roots and I got a broken hand because of a root system that was deep and immovable. And, um, you know, shallow roots don't do a lot of good for the strength of a plant, but deep roots do amazing things. So how deeply rooted is Christ in you? And you really don't know until you're tested. You really don't know how deep your roots are until you face tragedy, until you face just opposition. What do you do? Look, everything in life is a test. I I see that. And, you know, I looked at my broken hand, as a test. I looked at my day in hospital as a test. I looked at my, I'm looking at my reaction to my trials as a test. And every day I sit there saying, Lord, give me grace that when people look at me, they see that I'm passing my tests. And it's just so important that that this is not just preaching for Sunday, but this is living for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. None of us are immune from stuff happening to us. You want to be a pastor? You want to be a pastor? Get used to being betrayed. Get used to people demanding more of you than you can give. Get used to having people on your side for one week and then the next week they're they're, they're criticizing. Get used to that. But also get used to the fact that there's plenty of people that will continually love you and continually be there for you and and support you. You've got no idea how many offers of help that Anne and I have received this past week. It's just been absolutely beautiful. And, And we choose to focus on that rather than the bad stuff. And you just get to pass your test when you're able to put it all into perspective and say, God, you give me strength because Christ dwells deeply within me. Second thing, if you want spiritual formation to take place, are you getting something out of this? Is this helping you? You know, I mean, hey, I'm not giving you lollipops here. I'm giving you some steak this morning. Some of you, man, I'd love to give you a few sort of stories so that you could chew through the steak, but I haven't got time for that. So uh, listen to it again a couple of times. I want to talk to you about the armour of God this morning. The armour of God. One of my favourite books is Pilgrim's Progress. Besides the Bible, it's Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, when you read Pilgrim's Progress, you find 
that he gets to a certain stage where the armour comes on. So he doesn't have the armour right from the beginning. And oh my goodness, he gets to battle the enemy with no armour. And you get pretty beaten up. But it's a beautiful thing when he gets his armour on and now he's in battle with the enemy because now it's, he's got a sword. And uh, it's a beautiful thing at the end of the fight when he sticks it into the enemy, the, the sword, the sword of the spirit, and the enemy runs away because Christian has his armour on. Do you know what? Let me ask you a question. How's your armour? How's it going? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 8, talks about the armour of God. And, and I don't know about you, but, but I actually see myself as a knight of the communion table. I know that King Arthur had his knights of the round table. I'm a knight of the communion table. I commune with my king on a daily basis and I sit around his communion table and I see myself as one of God's knights. And so my armour, you want to know what colour my armour? It's gold coloured. I've got gold. I don't know about you. Maybe some of you got silver or black. Any black knights around here? I don't know. But mine is gold and it sparkles and it shines. And, and, and it's a wonderful thing to see yourself as a knight of the communion table. Because then you see that it's not just about you, it's about the responsibility you have for those around you that might be children or that might be weak or might be backslidden or might be those who have taken off their armour and now they're exposed to all of the schemes of the enemy the roaring lion who goes around seeking whom he can devour. And I'm not sure that too often we see our Christianity in that light. Too often it's all about me rather than, hang on here, my spiritual maturity is about how I impact the lives of those around me. Now, I, I would love every single one of you to have that armour on. And, and what is that armour? The Bible talks about it in Ephesians 6. 10 to 18, it talks about having this belt of truth. You know what's interesting with a belt? Is that everything falls off if the belt isn't tight. Huh? Everything falls off. If you haven't got truth on, everything falls off. And the world is hitting truth on a regular basis. Because the world says, we've got the truth. But what they have are deceptions. You want to know where the truth is? Thy word is truth. And if you're not in the word, then you're not in truth and everything will fall off. It'll fall. I'm telling you right now, it will fall off. And then you're going to get abused and misused for declaring the truth. God's word is truth. And nobody will ever stop me from saying that. I, I'm, I'm not going to bow down to wokeism. I'm not going to bow down to what this world demands. I'm not going to bow down to anything. This is what I bow down to, the Word of God, because that will last forever. So here it is, the first feature. When Paul talks about the armour of God, the first feature he talks about is the belt of truth. So let me ask you a question. Input, formation, what, what are you imbibing? What truth are you imbibing? What are you imbibing into your spirit that you think is true, but is not true? Because this world is trying to force feed you their truth and its lies and deceptions. And if you're not into the Word of God regularly, then something ugly is being formed in you rather than something beautiful. Can anybody say amen to that? Amen. So second thing, it talks about the breastplate of righteousness. What a beautiful thing it is to be righteous. What a beautiful thing it is to not feel guilt and shame. You got no idea what a beautiful thing it is to walk up onto the stage, be able to stand in front of you with, a, with this breastplate of righteousness saying, God, I'm doing my best to the best of my ability. 
I'm doing my best rather than secret sin. Oh, I hope nobody finds out. I hope this and I hope that. No, no, no. Open life. Righteous. The breastplate of righteous. Oh, I so want that for you. Man, I so want that for you. Every man stand up. Come on. I want every man in this room to stand up because I want to pray a breastplate of righteousness upon every man in this room. I'm telling you, the enemy wants to destroy your credibility by putting unrighteousness into your life. But today as men, we're going to stand up. What do you say, women of God? Uh, Don't you want your men around you to be men who are righteous, men who stand in integrity, in righteousness. Come on, if you're at home and you're a man, why don't you stand up as well? He said, but but I, I, I'm watching in a coffee shop. I don't care. Just stand up. Why is it? Because it's a sign of faith. It's like they're saying, why? What's he standing up for? And you can tell him, because I'm putting on a breastplate of righteousness. That'll, that'll empty the coffee shop straight away. Amen. Come on. I want you to put your hand right there on your heart and say, Lord Jesus, I plead the blood. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But on top of that, fill me with righteousness. Give me strength on a daily basis to choose righteousness over unrighteousness in my home, in my business, in my private life, when nobody is watching, help me stand as a man of righteousness with the breastplate of righteousness in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, come on, give the Lord a great big hand of praise. (laughs) Jesus, rise up righteous men. In the mighty name of Jesus, in the mighty name, the mighty name, you you may be seated. Shoes, preparation of the gospel, evangelism. Come on, wherever you go, you take the gospel with you. I love the fact that it's shoes, your feet, your feet shod. It's shoes, just wherever you go. This, see, this is this is what people that have spiritual formation, they're always looking for an opportunity to share Jesus. Why? Why? Because it's only Jesus that is able to heal the broken. It's only Jesus that's able to give hope. It's only Jesus that's able to fix things that are out of order. And for us to go into a broken, and and let me tell you, if you open your ears, you'll see brokenness wherever you go. You'll, You'll hear brokenness. You, you, you'll feel it, you'll sense it. And what people need is Jesus. Come on, have your feet shod wherever you go. Hey, I'm here. And my job now is to share Jesus. Come on, are you open to that? See, people that have spiritual formation are open to that. It's, it's the armour of God. You, you know, come on, don't let this be just a teaching that you put on the shelf. Let this be something that you actually wear on a 24, seven day basis. Shield of faith, that shield of faith where you're able to deflect the fiery darts of the enemy because you've got faith. See, the enemy wants to put fear into your life every single day. Every day he wants to put fear into your life. How many of you this week have encountered a fearful moment. Maybe, maybe it's to do with health. Maybe it's to do with family. Maybe it's to do with, with uh, finances. Maybe it's to do with, with the end of the world. But how many of you this week have encountered fear? Give me, give me a raise this week. Come on. Those of you that encountered fear, stand up. I want, I want to pray for you right now. You say, John, what are you doing? I'm praying in the mighty name of Jesus. I'm coming against the works of the enemy, the fiery darts of the enemy. Because it doesn't matter how mature you are, the enemy wants to inflict fear upon you. Fear, fear of failure, fear of falling over, fear of death, fear of all sorts of things. And Anne was telling me one of her biggest fears in life was flying. And, um, and she wasn't able to get on an aeroplane to fly because of fear. And God spoke to her and said, uh, 
You don't trust me enough. And she got confronted with the fact that she made fear more powerful than God. And then she says, Lord, I will trust you. I will trust you. And when she started to confess trust in God, because that's what faith is. It's Faith is confessing what you know is the truth. God, you've started my life. You're going to finish it. There's nothing that's going to come my way that you don't allow. I, I trust you. That's the shield of faith. I want everybody that's standing, put your hand on your heart. And I want you to say this, God, I trust you. You've started the work. You will complete it. And today, I break the power of fear in my life through the shield of faith. In Jesus' name. Now, Lord, let every single person see that shield surrounding them. I pray right now that every fiery dart of the enemy will hit the shield and fall to the ground so it can be stepped on in the mighty name of Jesus. Come on, some of you, do some prophetic symbolism and step on those fiery darts of the enemy. Those of you that are standing, I want you to step right now on some fiery darts of the enemy. They've hit the shield, they've fallen to the ground. Just rub it into the ground and get rid of it in the mighty name of Jesus. Let not fear take hold over God's people in Jesus' name. Come on, give the Lord a great big hand of praise. Amen. You can be seated. Then it talks about this helmet of salvation. The helmet protects your mind. What, what is going into your mind? Because whatever is going into your mind that's ungodly is forming something within you. And I'm not sure that we fully understand it because so often we just take it from the left to the right. It's all going in. It's going into our mind. And come on, we, we need to just stop stuff getting into our mind. And if you're parents, make sure that you stop it getting into your kids' minds. There's so much rub. And you just got to remember this, that whatever is going in is forming something. Is what is going in forming something beautiful or forming something ugly? Because at the end, the end result will be, well, we don't like what we see. It's because something ugly has been formed because ugly stuff has been taken in. Protect your mind. Put that helmet of salvation. And it talks about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Oh, my goodness. Are you hungry for the Word? Do you, do you love the Word of God? Oh, I so love the Word of God. I so love opening up the Word. you got no idea how big a buzz I get when I open up the Scriptures to you and then open up the Word of God to you and, and, and give you solid meat that's able to cause you to be mature rather than lollipops that just whatever. Just there's something powerful about the Word of God. It's solid. And you defeat the enemy. You defeat the enemy. You stab him. You, Jesus, three times when he was confronted by the enemy in the wilderness on his 40-day fast, quoted, it is written. He got the sword out. He just gave it to the enemy. It is written. Bang, take that. The sword of the Spirit. You will defeat the enemy with the sword of the Spirit. And then the last, the last part of the armour is actually a spirit. And Paul talks about the spirit of praying always. And sometimes we miss the seventh feature of the armour because it's not seen as a physical thing. It's seen as a spirit. This praying always in the spirit of prayer, just, just bathing yourself in prayer. And, and prayer just brings the presence of God into your situation. Oh, there's nothing more beautiful than just sensing, sensing the presence of God. 